sometimes it's hard to come down from that a little bit, right? So we're way up here and we're thanking him. We're taking the time. We get energized because if you really think about it, we have a lot to thank him for. And when we're supercharged like this, it's because we're hyper-focused on the good that he's doing in our life, not the negative. So let's keep going, y'all.
Y'all just be seen for just for a second. Miss Anita, take off here. Good morning, everyone. My name is Anita Wellborn. I am the Director of Ministry Development and the Women's Ministry here at Carolina's Cornerstone. And I am so excited to be here this morning with all of you. And if you are new or visiting with us, we are so excited that you are here with us this morning to worship our Lord and Savior and to be a part of this beautiful service that we have today. I am extra excited this morning because we leave this week for our ladies retreat Woo! check out your beautiful shirts that you're going to have an opportunity to purchase when you get there there's lots of different styles and stuff so be sure to bring your cash be sure to bring your cards because you're going to want to buy some of the stuff that we have please 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 be praying for our ladies retreat please be praying for our speakers please be praying for the women that are attending because this week will be the week that the enemy will choose to attack everyone that's on our list to go to try to prevent them from going and getting what the Lord has for them. And so I want you to be praying for our women this week uh, and our speakers and especially uh, also our heavy lifting squad. This, that's our group of guys that are going to be going with us that helps us pick things up and put things down. And so let's give them a big round of applause. All you men, we appreciate you so very much. We couldn't do this without you. Um, inside your worship folder is a lot of information. Um, a couple things I want to be sure to point out. Um, check out the back. Kids things that are happening. Students things that are happening. Um, right here in the front on the bottom. We are already doing sign ups for our Connie Maxwell uh, April weekend. We need painters and plumbers. If you know how to do either of those two things, we need to get you to get signed up. It is April 21st and 22nd, I believe is the... 21st, 22nd, I am correct, yay. Um, and we want you to get signed up. Out in the foyer is the way you get signed up, all the way toward the front doors. There's a table there. Get your name put on that list so you can be a part of our prep weekend for our summer mission week. But Barry, I have a question for you. I have an answer, I always do. Always do. Um, we have books this morning because I, I just wanted to share. Woo, that was really loud. We're just trying to make sure you're paying attention this morning. Everybody awake now? Good job. Okay, so did you ever read... 
books to Megan and Katie when they were little? Yeah, I did. And one of the books that, that, that I used to try to read to them, and, and it was a book that I actually was, when I was a kid, it was found in, I used to live in Fort Mill, grew up in Fort Mill, and Dr. Cuff That's and Mark. Indian land. You grew up in Indian I, land. I grew up in Fort Mill. Okay. And the doctor's office was in Fort Mill, okay. okay. And, and Dr. Cuff and Martin, some of y'all remember, especially if you're original Fort Millians, like she is, I'm not a Fort Mill, I'm an Indian land-ism, whatever you want to call it. That's right, Dr. Dr. Henry, Dr. yes. Henry? But they used to have this in that in the doctor's office when they used to, they, they didn't have to be politically correct in those days, and so they just had. And so I, I took this book and started reading to my you know, and you know, they would, of course, Megan would go to sleep on me when I was reading it, you know. She no, does that when I'm do preaching, that. too, no. don't you? She's shaking her head, no, she did That's not. That just cost me $25, I can tell well, you. Well, I have just one. My kids, I read to my kids all the time, and this was one of Mackenzie's. That's my daughter, um, my son sitting right down here, Gavin. Um, and he, he, he liked this one, too, but not as much as Mackenzie did. This was one of her favorites called Escape from the Zoo. How many of you, Barry likes to do surveys. I'm going I'm to play Barry yeah. today. How many of you read stories, books, to your kids or your grandkids as they were growing up. Yeah, there you go. That's a good. That's Let's a give good ourselves one. a big hand. Yeah, we did good. Yeah. Yeah. Here's why I asked that question. Could you imagine if you had not had any books to read to your kids as they were growing up, or any books that you could not have read to your grandkids? My mom read this to my daughter because she take, took care of her while I worked. And so she read this. So I, I treasure these books because my mom helped raise my daughter, and she read to her. But what if we didn't have books to read? Could you imagine? It, it really helps kids' imaginations grow. It, it really helps them begin to see things and learn things and um, bring things to reality in their lives. Books are hugely important, and I don't know if you know it or not, but for the past two weeks, we've been doing a book drive for a company called Promise and Pages. This organization helps put books in the hands of kids from itty-bitties, kindergarten, all the way up to high schoolers. And so what we need your help with is I know you have some books at home, and I know there are some that you would never get rid of because they are your treasured favorite that you read to your kid or your grandkid. But here's what we're asking. We all have books at our house that are sitting there collecting dust on the shelves. In the next two weeks, next week actually, is the very last week that we're taking up books. So we're going to ask that you go home, check your shelves, check the rooms that your kids used to grow up in. Are there some books that you could take out, bring here to the church, and would be willing to share with Promising Pages as they pass those books out to kids and parents that have none? Would you be willing to sacrifice a book, 10 books, or even 20 books, just doing nothing for anyone but collecting dust on the shelf? Barry, do well, you have any? Yeah, I, um, I don't have one. as many as I used to, but I can tell you where you can go. Uh, Scott Baker told me this on Friday morning. We were in our men's class mm -hmm. at 6.30 a.m. if anybody wants to be a part of that. But uh, Scott was saying you can go to... Um, what's that? Goodwill. Goodwill and mm -hmm. places like that, and you can buy all kind of books like that. And they're super cheap. They're and, like yeah. 50 cents to a dollar yeah. for a book at Goodwill. So, so, if you a, don't have so here's what we're going to do. do. I'm going to challenge all of y'all to go out and find three, four, five books and bring them back next week. And if you don't, I'm going to extend this and make you do it the next week. Yes. And if you don't, I'm going to come to your house. And don't be serving me no chicken. So I want to... But I want you to, I, I think the problem of it is, is that we assume that we have nice homes, nice cars, that everybody else is that way. That's not the truth. I'm doing a funeral today at 2 o'clock for Jane Perry. She used, she's always sat back over yonder in the back for me. And she was a school teacher at Evanport for 35 years, wasn't she, Will? And, and, and she, you're talking about somebody who was about reading and junk. Your church, this, this lady attended this church and was a part of that. And she would want us to do that help children. There are people will be at that funeral day at 2 o'clock that she changed their lives because she read to them. Absolutely. Just want you to know that. Look around <clears throat> at how many people there are in this room right now. Can you imagine how that table would look next Sunday if each of us brought five books? Yeah. Five books yeah. from kindergarten age to high school. Don't worry if you're not sure if this is an appropriate book. We have someone that's going to be going through the books 
Brandy and the kids ministry is actually sponsoring this with our um, our missions division, and we want to help them, and we want to help Promise and Pages. So please join us as we end up our month with all these books. I'll take that. Hey, let's give her a big hand this morning, okay? Absolutely. So, so, so this morning, I, I would just want to give you an update on some folks. We have a lot that's going on, and we have a lot of people that's had surgery this week. And Lord, we got them a lot Tuesday and Wednesday this week, and I want you to be praying for some folks. Um, one of the things I want you to put on the top of your list is the ladies' retreat. Next Sunday morning when you get here, things are going to look different for only one week. For only one week. Half the church, about 100 people will be in the mountains, and so it'll be kind of thin in here compared to what normally is. But that doesn't give you an excuse to stay home. Because God's door is open, and he wants his people to come. He don't want, I mean, I'm not knocking anybody watching it. I just want you to come if you can. I have some friends of mine down at Myrtle Beach, the Haywood family. They moved down there. I'm still their preacher. I have a lady in Pennsylvania that's on right now, and she's, I'm her preacher. And I don't mind being the preacher like that. So what happens to us is I want us to be praying for the ladies retreat. But I want you to come because the attendance will be down. But I don't want you to think that way. I want you to think, I'm here to serve the Lord. Then I want you to be praying for Jesse Samples. He got home, and he is doing good. Uh, we, he was able to have a Zoom in with our leadership team meeting this past week. I want you to be praying this morning for Frances Dewar, her health, and just pray for her restored. Jenny Rose Bunkley, uh, they used to sit over here on the West Coast side. She had a tumor removed off her spine on Friday and is, is doing good. And we think everything's going to be good. Shayer Mayo is in the back, back there. She's going to have uh, knee surgery for the third and final time because we got her a hot shot doctor, and he's going to fix her up. I want you to be praying for, for her. I want you to be praying for Jean Fulp. She's having surgery on her hand this week. Angie Mars is going to be having surgery. Uh, Glenn, is, he's going to do everything she asked him to do after that surgery. Right, Glenn? Amen, Glenn. That's right. And I want you to be praying for Giant. Blevins, he, he starts uh, chemo this week, and I want you to be praying for him. And, and there's all kinds of folks. I mean, Dan, Diane Bowser just got back from Ohio. Her mother had a stroke, and, and, and Dottie's brother's having surgery on his lung this week. And so there's just so much. Bill Grantham got out of the hospital yesterday. Uh, he had a major surgery on his leg, and, and I want you to be praying for him. And, and Bill, uh, I talked to him last night, and I said, how you feeling? He said, I feel good as long as I don't move. So I want you to be praying. But I want to pray differently. If you're here for the first time, let me say this to you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Please give me seven tries. That's all I ask. You can't go. I'm good. You just, you know, you, you just give me seven chances. And the reason I tell you that is because you, we see such a difference in our services and our people. But the word of God is what we preach. It is the word of God and nothing else but the word of God. So I want you to come and give us a chance. But I want to... Say, normally what we do is we have prayer time, but I want to pray differently this morning. So what I want to do is I want to ask uh, the Ladies of Grace team to come stand right here. Where, where are you chicks are at? Where y'all at? I said, one over here, one over there. I'm missing somebody. Who we miss? We're Sandy. Oh, she's coming. Come stand right here. All right, y'all y'all stand. And then there's a group of people that are speaking. You speakers. Connie. What's your name? Come on over here. Sarah, come on up here. I don't know who all this stuff is. I can barely see, Sarah. I can't see. No, I just can't see. I said, yeah, it comes Kara. <laughs> okay, all right, all right. Brandy's with the kids. We ask Kara, we, we, you know, okay, so we'll do that. So here's, here's what I want to do next. Just, just stay with me. Listen to me. All you ladies and other people, there's some men good that are going to... I just want you to stand up right where you are. I just want you to stand. If you're going, to stand up right where you are. Okay? There's, 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 and there's some that, that are on back. And, and what I want to do this morning, I want us to pray. So I want you, y'all chickies down here. Uh, um, I, maybe I can y'all make a circle right here. Just Okay, I don't know how y'all going to do that yet. Okay. Just, just make a circle. Bring what's her name, Sarah, in there too, yeah. And what I want you to do this morning, I want us to pray for this team. And, 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 but the ladies that are standing and here say, well, how can I pray for them? Well, you can pray for them, but I want, I want to get you and I want to make you an action this morning. 
I want you to do something I've been trying to teach our church during COVID. I want you to extend your hand toward one of them. Just, just reach out. Just extend your hand. It ain't going to hurt nothing. You can do this. Come on, come on. We're not doing this until y'all do that. Extend your hand toward somebody. Let's pray. Father, this morning, we lift up this lay's retreat. We haven't done one in four years, Lord. Four years. And I pray, God, as you have revealed to us that this is going to be some more of a humdinger service. And it's going to be a great weekend. And I pray, Lord, that as all these folks go, that we that are remaining here will be here and that we will be present next Sunday morning in our worship service. And what I pray, that we would just, as the day goes along, starting right now, our prayers would be toward the laser tree. And I pray that, Lord, the Holy Spirit would just fall all over us. And Lord, today, we give you praise for this church. We want to be right where you want us to be, doing right what you've asked us to do. God, I can't wait to see. Thank you for Anita and her team. Thank you for the speakers, for all the ladies attending, for all the people that are going to help make all this happen. We give you honor and glory and praise. And all God's people said, amen. Let's give the Lord a praise clap, okay? Y'all be seated.
I want you to I want you to give the praise team another round of applause this morning. Amen. I'm telling you, uh, this this uh, Sandy, this set has been so powerful this morning, and 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 I just I'm so excited about where we are this morning. And if you're here for the first time, thank you, thank you for being here. Please uh, just enjoy yourself, and we're gonna have a good time. And and this morning, so how many of you? I don't know about you, but in my life. I, I've, I've never really worried about what people think of me. I, I really don't. So you kind of need to know that. Um, you know, this morning, Blanche is back there wearing a, a, a Tennessee volunteer shirt. And all, Go ahead and get it over with. For you, for you four people that are here that like Tennessee. I, I, the reason I like Tennessee is because my friend Rick Barnes is from Lenore, North Carolina. And, and he used to coach at Clemson. And, and that's the reason I like him. And, and you never know, but there's people in here that, that we, we need to ask a new question. I didn't ask this question until not long ago. Uh, I have to be honest with you, it's, it's the weirdest thing I ever, ever thought about. And it, the question is, what does God think of me? I, I was in, a, in my own personal life. Let me, let me share this with you. Just because I'm the preacher doesn't mean I got all my stuff together. Don't you just love old people like him? I mean, but, but I don't have I don't have all my ducks in a row. I, I don't have it all together every Sunday. There are times when I just I feel like about this big. I feel like I'm that tall. There are times when I struggle just like you struggle, and and for some reason the older I get, I, I, I begin to I think about heaven just a little bit more than I used to, and I'm hoping he's got my mansion. I'm not living in no log house in heaven. But he's got a mansion for me. My, my Hummer will be there. My sun drop machine, the slushy will be there. And good music. So what happens is I, I got to thinking uh, uh, several, three weeks ago. It came to me in my prayer time. What does God think of me? Now, many of you in this room today, you may be on a journey and you've not ever given your life to Christ. And, I'm, and I, I am so proud of you being on that journey. But what I'm trying to say this morning is that for you and I, when we think about what does God think of me, I, I want to show you what he tells us. See, he tells us a lot of things. See, some of you in here, uh, you, you know who you are. You know what you, what you want to be in life. Uh, we seek and search to find ourselves. You know, we always we're told you need to find yourselves. And um, some of you have taken the personality test and the assessment tests. Some of you have discovered maybe that you're a lion while others are sheep. 
Um, I don't know what all that means, but they tell me it means something important. But what does God think of me? What does he say who I am? In, in all my years, I've never thought about it until three weeks ago. So you know what I discovered in this Bible, this book? I've discovered that this whole book tells us what he thinks about us. It does. It tells us what he thinks about us. And, and one of the things that I want to say to you this morning, that I want you to know this, number one thing is this, is that you're valuable. Turn to your neighbor and tell him you're valuable. I done took a bad coat. <laughs> so with this whole thing is, he says, this is God speaking to you, and I can take you from Genesis to Revelation, and a lot of this will come. He says, I'm the creator. I'm the one that created you. God does not make junk. You're not junk. Don't ever let anyone tell you anything. And the one who tells you that if you ever told that you're a junk, the one who's telling you that is the devil himself. He's your adversary and he hates your guts. And he'll lie to you in a second. And then he teaches us something else. Is that God has made you in his image. The Bible is very clear in Genesis 1. I, I think I'm going to be preaching every book, so you're going to have to hang on. Your, your pot roast is going to burn today. And so what happens is that it says, is I'm going to let us, the Trinity, let us now make man in our image. God has made you for a purpose, and God has made you for a reason. These ladies will be going, and they'll be on a retreat all week next week. This because they're valuable because God wants them to grow. And he's given you every piece of this. He tells us that we often in our lives, because we're valuable, God created man and woman. And, and what happens, a mistake was made in Genesis 3. Read the story. Sin enters the world. But God had a way. And God had a plan. A.W. Tozer says, what comes into your mind when you think about, about God is the most important thing about us. He tells us we're valuable. Number two, he says, we are new. We are, do you realize that when you receive Christ as your Savior, sin is not your master anymore? Look, when you receive Christ and give your life to Christ, what he says to you, I'm going to give you the power to be an overcomer. Listen to me. There's nothing that you cannot overcome. You say, now wait a minute, man. You, you don't know. There's some things in life that, that we are overcomers. There's some things in life you can't. It's like, I can't overcome having an artificial eye. I'll never be able to do that. Six years old, I have a uh, surgery and had my eye removed. It's six years old. I can't do anything about that. God had a purpose. You know what I've discovered? This is a redneck talking to you. You know what I discovered? He just wants me to see things one way. <laughs> it's all in how you see what happens in your life. He tells us, I want to save you from all these things. And then number something else I learned about that, how does God see me through Scripture? He says, uh, you have my spirit. When I received Christ, I had the pleasure of teaching this Wednesday night in the ladies' class back up. They let me in a couple times a year. And yeah, they let me in. And so what happens, I was teaching, you, when you receive Christ, you receive the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. I was talking to my friend Jim, who's here this morning, and he comes every once in a while, and he's, he's a pastor up in Illinois. And the reason he comes here is because it's warmer here. <laughs> and, 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 and the power of the Holy Spirit lives inside of you, and, 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 it, and it temples inside of you, and it guides you and helps you. And, and the Holy Spirit in your life is the mouthpiece from God. God speaks to us, and he tells us what to do. Some of you this morning are here because someone saw you and the Holy Spirit moved on them and they invited you. Don't live by your own power or understanding. Live by the power of God. Remember, I, the Holy Spirit will guide you and help you. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit is truth. And then he says, so what God thinks of you is that when you receive Christ, he transforms you. Some of you right now are saying, I can't change. I can't be this. You're defeated. And God is saying to you, I sent my son Jesus down the cross, and because of his blood shed, you can be healed. 
And he wants to help us, and it takes time, and it takes adjusting. And then he goes on and says, you will represent me. He made me. What does God think of me? He sees me as a representative for him. My friends, this morning, I want to say to you this week, slow down. Because he's all around us trying to get us to be representatives for him. And he tells us if we just need to do our very best. And, and, and he says, just walk. Can I just tell you, when you receive Christ as a Savior, listen to me. Listen, this is the word of the Lord. You're no longer a sinner, but you're now a saint. I want you to turn to your neighbor and say, how you doing, saint? Whatever person is beside you's name, tell him that. Go ahead, with John, to tell him Saint Saint Christopher. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yo. So, so I heard, I, I heard one one guy. He told, he looked at his wife and said, "You a saint?" And she says, "You ain't." <laughs> so, so what happens here is that God is working, and He says. That when you become, let me tell you the whole bottom line. What does God think of you? He's a God who gives second chances and third chances and 77th chance. He helps us and he gives us chances that we can be used. And the Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess with our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sin. I, I look in the scripture and I, I see something and there's a couple of people that I want to talk about this morning. I want you to see what God thinks of them, and then you can look at your life and see what God thinks of you. And one of those is a guy by the name of Matthew. Now, if you go to the New Testament, you'll discover him. Go ahead and take your Bibles, open it up, and hit chapter 1 or 2 there. And, and what you're going to discover, we, we meet a guy named Matthew. And, and, and what I want you to learn about the Bible, this is so important. The Bible doesn't only tell us the things that God did. The Bible tells us how he does things. It, it tells us how he thinks. The Bible is not some historical book. It is an eternal book for life. The eternal truth, every page is there. And we can apply every single thing in our life. And what is he trying to say? When we're in a crisis this morning, some of you in this room this morning and are listening to me about Facebook Live and all these things, some of you are in crisis this morning, and you're forking in the crisis mode, and there's a dilemma in your life. He says, I want to deliver you from that today. I want to help you. It's not going to just immediately disappear, but God's going to give you the power to get through it. And some of you came this morning, you're just checking off the list. Don't check off at church. There's more to church than this. Matter of fact, let me prove something to you. I want to deny, I want to invite you. Many of you have gotten this email and that's going out. Tonight at 6 o'clock, the Lord told me on Monday night that we need to have a special prayer service. I, I know we have a prayer ministry. Miss David Cookman back there in the back is leading that prayer ministry. But the Lord said there's so much going on in this church and there's so much, nothing's bad. It's not like we got some kind of division in the church. For heavens no, if we've ever been united, it is now we're united. And what he wants us to do is come and pray because there's many of you. We have so many people that are sick. And what does the Bible say about that? Call the elders and the people together to pray. Second Chronicles says if we come together and humble ourselves and pray, he will heal our land. And we need to pray for our land. And he says, so we're doing it at 6 o'clock. He said, well, I can't drive after dark. I'll let you go before it gets dark. Some of you will be able to come. Maybe you only can come for 15 minutes. Give me 15 minutes. Just come to the sanctuary and pray with us. No one's going to call on you to pray. No, no, we just want you to come and pray. If you have nobody to pray for, would you pray for the pastor of this church? He's a nice guy. So what happens to us, we, we want you to understand that he loves you this morning. So I want to go slow. I want to say something. He did not bring you here today to scold you. Rome Church, I'm not going to scold you. I don't want you to leave feeling bad today. I want you to introduce you to Jesus Christ. He says he brought you here because he wants you to know that he loves you. No matter who you are, no matter what you've done, he cares for your life. 
He has a plan for your life. He has a purpose for your life. And he is God and he is the God of the second chance. Some years ago, I was on staff over in Rock Hill and, and, and we had a couple in our church that had went through, were going through a divorce. And I just, you know, I, I, my heart was broken for them and we were praying and we were praying and we were praying. And I was trying to meet with them and trying to, you know, I'm a redneck. I don't know how else to do things. And so I'm trying to do everything I can. And so both of them called me the day before. They were supposed to come to the courtroom over in the old York County uh, courtroom over there. And they said, you know, would you come and pray for us? I said, absolutely. So I got there. I walk up the steps. This big old steps here at York, South Carolina. I walk up the steps, and they're standing there, and they're trying to figure out to have the courage to walk in that door. And I walked up, and I'm crying. I, had, I ain't going to lie to you. I was walking up the steps. I was already in tears, and they weren't, but I started making them cry. It works that way. I walk up, and I said, I want to plead with you. You don't have to walk through that door. I, I want to pray for you. And we prayed right there on, on the steps. And they didn't walk in the door. Their marriage had to be changed. They had to, they had to go home and figure it out. And they moved about 30, 40 miles up the road. They needed a fresh start. I agree with that. I'm telling you this morning, God loves you. And there's nothing that cannot be fixed if you're willing to sacrifice and do what it takes. So let me tell you about Matthew. Matthew's this guy. He's Jewish, and he uh, works for the IRS. I know what you're thinking. I don't like him either. But what happens, not this teasing. So what happens in the uh, and he's a tax collector. He was Jewish. The problem was is that the, the, the Jewish people didn't like the Roman government, so if you worked for them, they hated you. They even called you a term in Jewish, which means the word pig, which means that you're the lowest scum that you can be. He's the most hated because they feel like he was a traitor. He has sold out the people. And, and, and the worst part is, is that he can, he, every tax collector could charge anything they wanted to do. And, and let me just tell you how, how sorry they were thought of. They could not even go into a courtroom to give testimony because they didn't even respect them. So what happens is, is that the Roman government said, you, this is how much money you're to bring us, and you can charge whatever you want to. And they begin to do it and, it, and and what happens is Matthew becomes wealthy in this. So he's there. He's hated by all people on the Jewish side as well as the Roman government side. The society hates him, and he is not permitted to even go into a courtroom. He, he, ha, he, he loves money. His heart is hardened. Matthew is a person who really doesn't care what people think, and he didn't care what he says. He doesn't care anything about anybody else except his special little life he's got. But there's one thing about Matthew you need to understand. How does God see me? He saw, God, he saw Matthew as a spiritual bankrupt person. And then the worst is the church, quote, unquote, the church says to him, you're a tax collector, don't come to church. You're a tax collector, your prayers will not be answered, don't even pray. You're a tax collector, there is absolutely no hope for you, and the case is closed. May God have mercy on a church who says that to anybody. This church doesn't see it that way. I don't care where you're from, I don't care who you are and what you've done, I don't care. God loves you this morning. Maybe you're here this morning and you, you're struggling. God wants to help you this morning. And in Matthew's mind, what difference does it make? What difference does it make if I go to church? You know, the church don't even like me anyway. They hate me. But one day, Jesus passed by. Matthew was sitting at the table collecting his money, and Jesus passed by. How many of you have ever experienced Jesus passing by in your life? And, and Jesus comes and he says two words to Matthew, come follow me. Just come follow me. Just come on. Come on. Go with me. Help me. He knows nothing about Jesus and, and he began to think for a moment. So what does God think of you? What is God's opinion of you? Does God see you in your past? No, God sees you in the present moment. And he says, come follow me. 
Matthew tells us something really special in this. In Matthew 9, 9, he says these words, and this is the word of the Lord. When Jesus was leaving the place, he saw a man sitting in the tax office. His name is Matthew. And Jesus says, follow me. Follow me. Two words. Follow me. So Matthew gets up. See, Matthew was not looking for Jesus that day. But Jesus was looking for Matthew. And Jesus is looking for each one of us in this room and those that are watching us by live stream. He, he, is, he is looking for us and he wants us to be people that when he passes by, he makes a difference in your life. Jesus loves me as I am. I don't have to clean up. I don't have to do anything different. I just need to be who I am. This morning, you need to be you. You can't be anybody else but you. If you love the Doobie Brothers, you are a special person. And what he tells us is that he wants us to be who we are. And Jesus loves you just like you are. And he began to talk to him. You know what I've discovered about Jesus in this story with Matthew? Is that Jesus has a soft spot in his heart for people that don't know him. The Bible says that Jesus looks upon the crowd and he has compassion for them. He tells us this morning he's having compassion for you. And that's when he looks at me, he says, I love you. And Jesus calls me as I am. Listen, you can't, some folks, I, I, I used to get sick of hearing this with some of these churches. You got to clean up before you come. Listen, you ain't got to do nothing here. Just show up. It ain't my job to make you clean up. See, you wouldn't wear all the right clothes anyway. You wouldn't wear buckle jeans. You wouldn't wear untucked shirts. You wouldn't do this. But the problem of it is, is I don't need to do that to begin with. All I want you to do is to come and, and, and listen and plug in maybe possibly. And what he teaches us this morning is that he calls me right where I am. He did not tell Matthew, you got to change. Listen to me. You don't have the power to change. This morning, if you're here and you're battling with some addiction, and we all have hurts, habits, and hang up, you can't change it. I spent eight years on the board of Keystone. No one has the power to change without Jesus Christ. And he wants us to change. He wants us to be people that shows mercy. And sometimes our lives are pitiful. But let me tell you something. Jesus loves you. Jesus won't leave you any time in your life. Jesus will always be with you. Salvation is not a reward for doing good things that we have done. No, so none of this can be boasted. Salvation is a gift from God. He wants to call you into a relationship the same way he did Matthew. And he says, follow me. And Matthew follows him. He's calling you this morning to follow him. He is saying, I've given you certain gifts and certain talents. And you can do things. When Anita was saying a while ago, we need people. April 21st and 22nd, we need plumbers. We need painters, and we need people because we have a mission that God has called us. Last week, many of you were here to see Danny, the president of Connie Maxwell Children's Orphanage, and, and it's now the ministry. He, he sold out. He sold out to these kids, and you ought to go down and watch it. So this whole thing of Matthew, when he follows Jesus, what we discover in this whole thing is, is that Matthew himself is a representation, and we can see it, of God's grace in our lives. What he did for Matthew, he'll do for you. What he done for Joseph, he'll do for you. What he did for Elijah, he'll do for you. What he did for Ruth, he'll do it for you. And you begin to see these things. See, we look at the whole thing, and we begin to see that Jesus in Luke 5, uh, 1 through 3, it says, but what if we had been? Jesus meets Peter, and he's out there, and he borrows his boat to, to sit in and to teach. Peter follows him. And he says in Luke 5, 8, when Simon Peter realized what had happened, he fell to his knees before Jesus and said, Oh, Lord, please leave me. I'm too much of a sinner to be around you. <laughs> Jesus drags his tail the rest of his life with him. There's nobody in this room that's too much of a sinner. I don't care what you've done. You're not undoable. You're not a broken person that cannot be given the healing powers of Jesus Christ. And Matthew would follow him 
the rest of his life. He would give his life up and die for the cause of Christ. But this man, Peter, is the second person I want you to see. What does Jesus think about Peter? Peter's the first to be called. His name is Peter. Man, as a matter of fact, he becomes the rock of the church. I, I, if I had been Jesus, I wouldn't have picked Peter. As a matter of fact, I probably wouldn't have picked any of them disciples. I mean, you know, people who fish, they tell stories. I call one this big. You, you, you see what happens? Jesus uses us ordinary people to do extraordinary things. But let me talk about Peter for a second. Oh, he's a big boy. He's a blabbermouth. He, he doesn't think before he speaks. Do you know anybody like that? Don't raise your hands. Don't, don't. And so what we discover later on is, is Peter's trying to follow him. And, and he says in this, he, he, he tells us that Jesus wants to get into your boat. Peter has a boat. He's a fisherman and, and he and his brother and, and Jesus wants to get into your boat, your heart, and your life this morning. He, he, he says, I love you, and I want to be there for you, and I want to help you. And he wants to get into your boat and help you. Jesus wants to connect you where you are, not where you need to be, not where. He wants to connect you right where you are. He wants a relationship that's real and true. Listen, my faith never wavers. I get discouraged. But I believe that tonight God will call our church to pray. And it doesn't matter whether one person shows up or a hundred shows up. We're going to pray. And what he tells us is that when he calls us to go to Greenwood, South Carolina for the next 10 years to do a mission program down there every year, we're going to go. When he calls our student ministry to go to camp this year and we're expanding our, our levels of, of chairs, I don't care how many folks get real comfortable back here. When it comes to young people, I'll take this whole section and that section and that section and I'll make another church service just for y'all. You see, this is what happens when we're sold out and we're like Christ. He wants to be a part of your life. He wants to lead you. He wants to lead you to do the, what's the right thing to do. You know, you, you have to understand you can't do things on your own. Listen, when the Lord called me into the ministry and I said, do what? Yeah, I want you to become a pastor. Lord, you've got to be kidding me. There's got to be other people more well qualified. Just let, me, just let me be where I am. Lord, I promise you I'll do a good job. I had a job in the car business, and every day I got cussed out. Well, who would want to give up that? And so what happens, God is speaking to us, and he's saying, and, and, and when you're, you know, you, you look at your life, and he says, but I want you to follow me. God, you want me to do what Matthew did? Yes, I want you to follow me. You want me to do what Peter did? Give up everything? Yes, I want you to follow me. You see what happens when we get in connect. Jesus, he wants to get in your boat, and Jesus wants to get you out of your boat. Man, what is the deal here? Jesus is saying to us, there are times in your life, in your boat, in your life, he wants you to get out of the boat. Look at this. Matthew 14. Some of you are familiar with this chapter. He says, meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble far away from the land for a strong wind that had risen and they were frightened and it was heavy waves. It's three o'clock in the morning. That's the first problem. My daddy said that nothing good happens after 12 o'clock. And Jesus came toward them walking on the water. And when the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified. What that means, the word terrified in the Yates Translation Dictionary, it means they were scared to death. And Jesus spoke to them, don't be afraid, take courage. And old Peter, listen, can you imagine, I want you to picture this with me. I've told this story a hundred times, but I want to tell it again for you that have never heard it. I want you to imagine this big old water out here, and it's dark. On the river, there's no, there's no moon, there's no stars, there ain't no light out there at all. And Jesus comes walking on the water. And they see something out there that's an object, and the, storm, and the boat's doing this. And, and you're going, how many of you have ever been on a boat that starts doing this? What do you start doing? Hit the deck! That's what you do. So, so what happens is that everything that could go wrong is wrong. Listen, I, I don't even hardly can swim. And that's why I'm on a cruise. They give you this life jack. I said, I'll take two. I'll take two. What happens to us is that they do it, and then, then all of a sudden they start recognizing him. 
You know how, you know how they know who he was? Because they had spent time with him. And so Peter, being who he was, he's in the boat, and the boat's kind of one of them has a point, and Peter's, he's looking at him and going, I believe that's Jesus. Hey, Jesus, how you doing back here, buddy? And Jesus says, come, come on, walk out here. You talking to me? Yeah, I want you to walk on the water. Come on, come on, step out of the boat. And he turns around and looking at these guys behind, and they're going, Peter, sit down and shut up. We, this is all you do is talk, talk, talk. We want, and you're not going to do it. You just, y'all don't believe I'll do it. This is what Peter's conversation with these guys. Y'all don't believe I'll step out there. They said, no, we don't, Peter. I'm going to prove it to you. And then the conversation goes, and finally Jesus says, come on, come on. And guess what he does? Now, I don't know exactly how it works, but I can tell you, in my little imagination, he sticks one big toe out there in the water. He's trying to do this swan thing in Karate Kid. And he, he's put one toe on there. The only problem with that, you put one toe on there, pardon my friends, you got to get the rest of this to come out there. And finally, he, has, he believes enough to do it. And so he gets out of the boat, and it's like walking on a concrete sidewalk. He's walking down through there. Now, I don't know about you, but see, I know Peter's from Fort Mill. And, and what happens is when we do something like that, we become banny roosters. We, we get poked at, and, and, and he starts walking. And, and, he, and, and he, he's, he's, he's just looking at Jesus, and he's focused on Jesus. And, he's, and, you know, and Jesus has to be smiling. And all of a sudden, Peter makes a mistake. Now, this is what I think happened. This, I mean, the Bible says he took his eyes off Jesus, right? Well, the book says that. I just want y'all to see if y'all are paying any attention. He said, now I think Peter's turned around and telling him, you know, nah, 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 nah. I really do. And he starts sinking. Now, here's the part of the process of the story. If God wants to get you out of the boat, he's going to take care of you and get you back. So here's what happened. He, you don't think this Jesus just drug him all the way back to the boat through the water, do you? No, Jesus says, come on, get, get up here, stand up. Get your eyes on me. Quit worrying about all this other stuff. Quit worrying about the winds and, and, and Peter stand. And he and Peter walk back to the boat. I don't know about you, but I know what I would have done if I'd been Peter. I'm going to see y'all missed the blessing because you didn't get out of the boat. You see, the thing here is, is it takes faith to get out of the boat. Maybe you're here this morning. You say, I, I, I don't know about this Jesus thing. I don't, you know, it takes faith to get out of the boat. He tells us, and it takes faith to step out in the waters of life that are trouble. Now, all Jesus is saying by you stepping out of the boat and stepping on, he says, focus on the power, and that is me. It is God's power that life changes in here. I don't know about you, but we were talking about this earlier, about reading little books to your children. You remember that little book called The Little, uh, the little Red Engine? And it's about the little, I can, I think I can, I think I can, I think. When Peter gets out of the boat, he ain't thinking he can, he can as long as he's focused on Jesus' power in his life, anything's possible. See, every time you make a decision, it's on faith. Can I just say something to you? Sometimes in your life, you're going to sink. I don't care who you are. I don't care where you are. I don't care how great of a Christian you are. There are going to be times in your life when you're just going to sink. Just remember this, while you're sinking, Jesus is extending his hand, and he's going to pull you up. He's going to pull you up and get you back on the right path. You know how I know he did Peter that way? Because it would be some time later that, that Peter would preach before the people, and 3,000 people were saved in one day. Aren't you glad that Jesus picks us up out of the sinking clay? I've learned in Isaiah 54, 10, it says, The mountains and the hills may crumble, but my love for you will never end. I don't know about this morning. Maybe you feel like God doesn't love you. God does love you. God loves you this morning, and, and I've learned this about him. If you will just trust him this morning as your Savior and Lord, you can completely accept him. You won't understand everything, but you can accept him for who he is. And, and, and he has an unconditional love for you this morning. No one will ever love you like God loves you. The Bible says in Romans 8, me and Ben, all of us were in a class on Friday morning. God, the, you, nothing can separate you from the love of God. 
And then he tells us that we're totally forgiven. So you mean to tell me all my sins of the past, present, and future are forgiven? I'm exactly telling you that when you receive Christ as your Savior. And, and this is why it's so important that every day when the end of the day that you take and go back through your life, just take a few moments and you, maybe you didn't handle this right. Maybe you didn't handle this right. Let me tell you something. Your preacher's not perfect. If you don't believe, just ask some of the folks. Randy, be quiet. And, and what happens? Wednesday, we, we were battling with some internet problems and we're out back and, and we're trying to do things and we were shifting yesterday or Friday. We were shifting from analog to digital. And I don't even understand all that stuff. And we're back here and I'm frustrated. Now, let me just tell you, you know, I, I, I tell you when there's a problem, I give you three minutes to do something with it. If you don't do something in three minutes, I'm going to do it. And we're back here in, in, in a building. Don, I think it was your building. Man, it was aggravating this thing. Being, being a smart aleck and not being patient. Y'all know what I'm talking about, right? And so what happened, the thing just wouldn't, I reached and I just grabbed the cord out of the wall. And there was a person behind me and that thing popped from right on the knee. And I don't know what they said because I was so mad at myself for pulling the cord out. You see, what I'm trying to say to you is this. You're going to make mistakes. You're not going to handle everything right. But at the end of the day, you can go, I need to make this right. This week, the Holy Spirit spoke to me. And he said, you need to go and you need to go to this person and you need to start trying to restore the relationship. See, I don't question God. When he speaks to me, I just do it. I said, okay. So, I get my good-looking truck. I go get my three hairs cut. It was my, if you want to know where I am, every Wednesday at 1230, I have therapy. It's called getting a haircut. After the haircut, I went over and, and, and spot, stopped and just spent some time. Didn't go in and try to rehash the past. I just was there. You know what I learned? I mean, I know this. I teach this all the time. But even sometimes when we think we we got it all together, we ain't. We need to be people that are willing to say, Lord, help me to be what I ought to be for you. Maybe you don't understand all this Jesus stuff. I didn't either. But you're in a church that will take time and spend time and help you find it. But I'll tell you this. If you receive Christ as your Savior today, if you don't know him, I promise you, he'll give you a power you can't explain. He'll give you a love for people you can't explain. He'll let you help people that you never want to help before. And he wants to move in your life today. If you want to walk on the water, you're going to have to get out of the boat. You're going to have to get out of the boat. With every head bowed and every eye closed for just for a moment. If you want to walk on water, you got to get out of the boat. If you want your life to change, you got to get out of the boat. Maybe you feel like you're sinking this morning. He says, get out of the boat. I'll help you. He's not going to send you a thing. He's going to reach and grab you by the hand and take you out. He's going to get you out of that sinking clay. This morning, he's saying, what do you think of me? I've just given you a whole entire sermon. He loves you. He cares for you. He wants you to repent and follow Jesus. He don't want you to become a holy roller. He just wants you to be you. So Jesus, right now, I just want these folks in their hearts to pray that you would give them the desire to commit themselves to you. Jesus, right now, I want you to move among our people. And Lord, help us to be where we need to be. God, help us to trust you and not to get caught up in all the messes, but help us to trust you. So, Lord, right now, I just want to open this altar up. And for people that might want to come and pray right now, they can come and just kneel. Maybe there's someone here this morning that knows you as Jesus as Savior and Lord. I would love to introduce them to that. All they have to do, Lord, is simply say, Jesus, I love you. I don't understand it, but would you forgive me of my sins and come into my life? And he will do it right now. 
This altar is open right this moment. Whosoever will come, come. Holy Spirit's moving. If your heart's racing about 90 miles an hour, you need to come on. This altar is open for you. God, thank you. Lord, thank you for the Jane Parish. Thank you for her life. Thank you for, for, for Will and Allie and, and Riley and Asher and all those, Lord, that are in this family. There's bunches of them. Lord, thank you that our student ministry just wants to pray. God, I thank you for that. I am so touched by our student ministry this morning that they're just moving and believing because, Lord, they're learned, they have learned how to get out of the boat. And we give you praise. We give you praise. God, as we get ready to walk out of here in just a second, help us to say thank you. Would everyone stand at their feet? Let's sing this with them. Here we go. I can't thank you. Thank you. 
let's give them a big hand. I want to do one more thing. I'm, this is what happens when you're the preacher. You forget all these things. Um, when you leave today, we're going to give you another set of 12 cards. And the cards are designed. The very first one has Easter. I, I want you to learn how to give these cards out. Your name's not on just the church's name. You would be shocked that the people that can be one for the Lord by simply getting out of the boat and handing someone a card. Let's give the Lord a praise clap. Have a great day.